city building. My name is uh, Professor Jane Frances Abu. I'm from Nigeria. I work with the National Open University of Nigeria. And I want to welcome all of you to this session. We are going to have four presentations. And I think the next thing I have to do is to introduce the, the topics and the presenters. The first one is a, a framework for categorizing digital materials. So just a minute. So this presentation is proposing a framework that allows a differentiated categorization of digital learning resources, which gives guidance for institutional policy development. Then the next presentation, uh, and this presentation is by Ben Jensen and Robert Shoa. I hope I got it. <laughs> then the second one is Go Open, supporting higher education staff engagement in open educational practices. This paper is uh, by Ona Farrell, James Brunton, uh, uh, Alan Brin. It's uh, that's rather about uh, a seven, lot of people. A lot of people. <laughs> and I don't want to mispronounce names. <laughs> and the paper reports on the activities of a team of Dublin City University, DCU, composed of academic staff and library staff who engage in collaborative projects. The, the next one is uh, designing infrastructures allowing higher education teachers to reuse, adapt, exchange, and exchange open educational resources by Nadine Schroeder, Sophia Kra, and Joannis Vent. Yes. According to this paper, when designing OER inf infrastructure, it is essential to be aware of practices higher education teachers have for digital environment when using and revising as well as sharing open educational resources. Then the last presentation actually by 17 presenters, Pathway to Learning, International Collaboration Under COVID-19, by Robert Farrell and Adams, Margaret Bouchesha et al. Okay. We have about 16, 17 presenters slated for this uh, topic. And uh, what the title or the paper seeks to note is that both these aspects were presented in education research, that the aspect that they want to present in the presenting a recent education research collaboration between African Council for Distance Education and Open University UK, Pathway to Learning. So I want to welcome everyone to this uh, session. I think we'll have to go straight. Uh, with that being said, uh, according to our guideline, uh, introduction should be 10 minutes, and I think we are okay, although it's less than 10 minutes. All right. And also you need to note that uh, you can use the chat button to send messages and also the question by button for questions for the presenters. So I think we are good. We can go straight to the first presentation, a framework to categorizing digital learning material by Ben Johnson and Robert Shaw. So please welcome, please take it from there. I forgot to unmute. Thank you, uh, Jane, for your introduction and welcome everybody and uh, for uh, our presentation. Uh, this presentation is uh, compiled by uh, by Ben Janssen and, uh, and myself. Um, we have agreed that, uh, that I will do the presentation and that Ben will uh, monitor the chat for questions. As I understood earlier is that uh, 
the, the discussion and the Q&A will be after all four presentations. So that, uh, uh, that will be the, um, the order of this uh, webinar. Yeah. Well, first, uh, why a framework? Um, yes. Uh, I will first sketch you the context in which the uh, the need for such a framework, as we will present, uh, was uh, was felt. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, we are now in the third year of an uh, of a national innovation uh, program, which is called the Acceleration Plan. Uh, and in this plan, uh, the uh, higher education uh, and the Ministry of uh, Education, uh, Culture and Science and the uh, SURF, which is uh, the, the, the ICT organization for, uh, for all higher education in the Netherlands, the cooperation, uh, work together to boost innovation in, uh, uh, in education with ICT. It is divided in several, uh, several topics, and one of the topics uh, which, where institutions are working on is innovation in digital open learning resources. And uh, in this uh, context, we, uh, we are not only working on uh, adoption and uh, boosting uh, adoption of open education resources, but we are uh, adoption of digital learning resources in general. And among them are also open educational resources. So uh, that's, that's the context. So we, uh, we are not only talking about OER, but we are also talking about other types of resources. And we had the question, what are we talking about when we use this term digital education resources? Because I don't know if any one of you has ever noticed, but when you will are looking for what is meant by digital education resource, it is very hard to find, or even it is impossible to find a standardized definition for it. Uh, there are many uh, many uh, is written, uh, there's a lot is written about uh, uh, educational resources, and then there become come some, some sorts of definitions uh, for it, but that there is not one standardized definition for it. And that makes the question of what is meant by OER, what, uh, what is meant by other, other, other types of educational resources, that makes it difficult uh, to, uh, to, uh, to think about. So to, uh, this, when this question arose, uh, we were thinking, uh, and that is our proposal should be present here, to uh, de devise a framework. And uh, well, we were not the first to devise this framework. We, we found uh, a framework uh, David Riley had sketched in an, um, I think it was a presentation he held last year. And we have uh, taken this framework as, an, uh, as a base, uh, basis and we extended this framework to, uh, to comprise all the types of uh, educational resources we thought was, uh, uh, were for use in this uh, uh, acceleration plan. And it allows us to position these different types of learning resources uh, in relation to each other. Um, so we used two dimensions uh, for this framework. The first dimension was the access or accessibility of, the, uh, of a digital uh, learning resource. And the others are the right to adapt those resources. Well, people uh, familiar with open educational resources know that these are the two main uh, dimensions uh, to, um, to follow. Um, and Therefore, for us, it was uh, quite clear to use these two dimensions to categorize learning resources. To, when we look more closer uh, to each of these two dimensions, uh, and also these were the dimensions of David Wiley also used in his framework, which I think will be no surprise everyone knowing David Wiley. Uh, we, uh, uh, we saw four values for the dimension access or accessibility. We say, well, you can have no restrictions at all for everyone. So uh, uh, learning resources can be uh, uh, available for everyone without any restrictions. We call this open access. There can be some restrictions, but not financial. And then still everyone will have those restrictions. In most cases, uh, this will be uh, uh, creating a free account to uh, access those resources 
uh, and that is uh, the, the non-financial restriction which is mostly used uh, in, in, in this case for these types of resources. You can think, for instance, on MOOCs where you have to uh, create an account which is uh, for free and then you can access uh, uh, the MOOC. And we can also think of non-financial restrictions, but not the, the resources are not accessible for everyone. This is also called a walled garden. Uh, uh, those are uh, communities, in most cases communities, but can also be institutions where you have to, um, to, to prove that you are part of this community, mostly also with, with a login, and then uh, you can uh, get access to these uh, resources, and there can be financial restrictions. Uh, and only with, uh, and then uh, you can access uh, these uh, resources. The other dimension are the adaptational rights. Adaptation rights, well, with two things, things are, uh, uh, resources can be either adaptable or non-adaptable. Adaptable will have users have permissions and non-adaptable users will have no permissions to adapt the resources. And there's also the term free learning resources. And those are those digital learning resources where there are no re financial restrictions uh, to access them. And then we came to this framework when you uh, uh, have all these, uh, uh, when you have uh, sketched those two dimensions. Uh, so you see uh, uh, horizontally uh, the uh, accessibility where the most left is the, um, the 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 least uh, uh, of the most accessible and that the uh, most right are the least accessible um, uh, learning materials and to the uh, from top to bottom you see the adaptation rights with the most uh, uh, rights to adapt to the least rights to adapt uh, you see, we distinguish between the public domain and the CC0 licenses uh, because, well, everyone knows the Creative Commons license uh, where you have to, uh, which you can use to um, to uh, provide to the to the user uh, what they uh, what they are allowed to do with the resources and uh, uh, for instance uh, uh, attribution or share alike etc well those are, are common uh, you can call this the kind of common knowledge and uh, the the difference between the public domain and the cc0 is in the public domain it is by by, by kind of law that uh, uh, resources are in the public domain uh, in the netherlands it is after 75 years after the the death of the author uh, the works become available in the public domain. The CC0, you can decide as an author immediately whether or not you, uh, you, give, the, uh, light, you give your resource uh, without any uh, uh, um, conditions free to adapt. Um, well, uh, this gives this, this framework and using these dimensions, it gives us also the possibility to uh, closer define the types of, uh, the, uh, of learning resources we distinguish in the program. So first we have the open education resources. Well, actually these are the only types of learning resources we found where there is actually a more or less standardized definition, although there are several versions of these definitions exist. The, this definition is the one the uh, Hewlett Foundation uh, uses, but there's also the definition, uh, of course, of, the, of UNESCO, uh, which, uh, which are in, in, in some points um, uh, differ from this, but uh, actually are, uh, are, 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 use other wordings to, to say the same. We also have the type of, we, we use the term semi-open resources, and those are the open uh, resources, so the uh, adaptability are the five R's available, but they are only available to a limited group of persons. Uh, and uh, we have the term commercial resources, and those are the teaching, learning, and research resources, only available under financial restrictions. That will be the definition we use in uh, our uh, uh, innovation program. And we also have the term closed resources. And in, in most cases, commercial resources and closed resources are used uh, as synonyms, but actually they aren't. Because closed resources, uh, well, as we, as we see it, they are just teaching, learning, and research resources, and they are not available for a person or a group of persons. 
so, uh, and that depends on uh, the per perspective of the stakeholder. For instance, when uh, learning resources are only available for people working at the institution where I'm working in, then those resources are available for me. But so everyone outside of my institution, uh, for them, those resources are not available, so they remain closed. And actually, uh, in, in, in a blog post, I made the, the comparison between closed resources and, the, uh, and what in the quantum uh, physics is called the... Uh, the metaphor of the um, Schrodinger's cat, where you can, uh, until you access, you try to access those resources, then you find out whether they are closed or not closed. And uh, before accessing, uh, you they can be both closed or non-closed. Mm -hmm. um, so here are our, uh, uh, um, placed our, our, uh, uh, categories in the framework. So you see the OER, the semi-open, which uh, include also uh, materials which cannot be adapted, are not, because they, for instance, have the, um, the, uh, the ND clause in the CC license, but they can still be uh, shared in, in this uh, uh, for, for, for a limited uh, uh, group of uh, persons. And we have the non-free, which we call the commercial. Uh, resources and well they can be adaptable or non-adaptable but that it depends on the kind of license you buy from the uh, publisher who are uh, uh, publishing those resources and uh, we have we uh, uh, used this framework now in our workshops uh, to uh, for, for people uh, starting using uh, uh, open or semi-open educational resources. And uh, uh, this, 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 uh, the, first, um, the first experience we have with these, uh, uh, with these uh, frameworks in, um, in this workshop is that it makes uh, things a lot clearer than just presenting all the definitions and all the stuff of, on, on Creative Commons uh, licenses, which in most cases will only focus on the OER and not on the other types of resources. And therefore we have um, placed also some examples of, um, of, uh, 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 of, of types of resources in this framework to make it more clear for the people we, we uh, have in our workshop. So this is uh, the framework we, uh, we wanted to present. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Robert. Thank you so much. Very insightful. I was trying to listen and also go through the chat. Uh, I think we have to take the second uh, presentation because from the guideline here, we'll take the questions and the other comments after the end of the four presentations. So, and we are doing great. I'm sure we're going to have a long enough time to trash out all the observations and the questions. Okay, so thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. So the second uh, is um, Go Open, supporting higher education staff engagement in open educational practices by Anna Ferrell and et al. So who is taking of the presentation from uh, the two? Jane, Jane Francis, me and, and James are here, yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you for the welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm gonna start and share my screen if that's okay. Yeah. So hi everyone, how are you? Uh, hopefully you can see my screen there, can you? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Um, so, Delighted to be here today at OE Global. Um, so this is a big group uh, involved in this project. So I, I, on behalf of the group, myself and James will be presenting today. Uh, the project is called Go Open. Um, it's a very small local open education project. Um, and I know uh, this being OE Global, people will be talking about big, national and regional projects, but this is a nice small uh, local project. And really actually it was inspired by OE Global. Two years ago, I think it was two years ago, when, when was OE Global in Milan? Was it 2019? 
Yeah, November November 9, 2019. Okay, so myself and James and another colleague, Lorraine, who's also involved in this project, went to OE Global in, in Milan. It was actually probably my last in-person conference since the pandemic, uh, fantastic conference. And we saw some really great examples at that conference of librarians working together with academic staff and learning designers and learning technologists uh, in, in team-based projects in their institutions. And we were really inspired by this. And at the same time, our university had a local funding call for a small, a small amount of money, seed funding, uh, to undertake projects in the area of teaching and learning. So in the airport and on the plane home, we wrote this project proposal. Uh, and this is a true story. So Go Open is a, is a child of, of OE Global. Uh, so what we came up with was there was very little going on in our institution in the way of open education, nothing formal. There were a number of people involved in, in, in some small level open education, I would say. So for example, some people would be uh, publishing open access, uh, sharing their research on maybe Zenodo or ResearchGate. The library, we, had, we have a, a, an institutional repository, but it, it's very narrow in what it will accept. So there were some small seeds, uh, I suppose, our direct colleagues in the National Institute for Digital Learning, we would have been more involved in open education. Um, and some of us had taken part in different open education initiatives and MOOCs, et cetera. Um, so I suppose it went from us dipping our toe into trying to spread the word. So we formed a team with members from our, our own unit. So it's called the Open Education Unit. Uh, we deliver online education programs and we collaborated with colleagues in the institutional library and then later on some colleagues from our learning design unit. Um, and it had a very simple aim. It was to try and support our university community to start engaging with open education, particularly in the area of teaching and learning. In the end, we didn't go so much into research, but in the initial aim, we did kind of talk about um, engaging the research side. So the, 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 the project Go Open was funded by the National Forum, which is a, an Irish national body, and also by the, by the university. Um, so as you can see, the, the project was project team was big, uh, representing lots of different parts of the university. And this proved actually to be uh, something quite unique. We, we found working with particularly librarians very different because they had very different perspectives, approaches to us. And we learned, we really, we really learned a lot from them. So the output and what we did in the project, I suppose, so we essentially wanted to put together a beginner's type guide to open education. Some small dipping the toe in the water examples and guidance uh, and, and, you know, I know there's, there's stuff out there. So what we did was curate, put it together, also write some new stuff as well. <clears throat> In terms of our process, the whole project took, took place during the pandemic. Um, so it was all done online. Uh, the timeline obviously was a bit disrupted by the um, pandemic, but, but we did manage to, uh, to get back on track. Um, so we worked with a combination of Zoom and Google Docs. And at the start, we kind of brainstormed what kind of things do academics want to know about open education and how, you know, different ways and approaches by, again, we looked at some of the literature that you can engage people in open educational practices. Um, and then we started collaboratively working on the resources. So James, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. And, and just to say as well, this would not be the only example of concrete teaching and learning uh, innovations uh, for us that have been directly inspired by attendance at OE Global conferences. I could, I could talk for the same amount of time about uh, open pedagogical assessments, which like what, what my team is doing now is directly inspired by the OE Global conference that was on in the Netherlands a few years ago. Um, so. The, the target market, as Orna already said, 
what we were thinking about in this uh, in this project was from our perspective how would we try to hook people who are not already involved or engaged in open educate open education open educational practices at all and it was it was really interesting for us to try not just uh don't just think about that from our point of view, but also from the librarian's point of view, because we're all we're definitely already in that bubble, whereas the, li the librarians are used to supporting different staff from all different parts of the university with different attitudes to their teaching and learning practices, never mind open educational practices. So our target audience was the uninitiated. And I suppose, we, I mean, for me, as part of the project, and, and I'm in another project uh, an, an eu an open game which has similar aims and we've we've thought you know we've thought about this from a different angle um you know often there's a lot about open education that initially can be a little bit intimidating from my own experience when i started coming to these conferences first and sort of really meeting you know open education scholarship open pedagogy um open you know open education policy national and international you know like that's a tough place to sort of if that's your first meeting of open education that can be tough so i t i picked out one of my favorite uh, open pedagogy definitions because i thought you know when i found this definition i was delighted but i think it's also there's a lot going on in that definition if you gave that to someone first it might not you know it might not hook them into uh trying something out in their classroom or trying something out in their in their assessments and the same with the policy a lot i think a lot of academics you know they, if they're doing their teaching and learning practice they they they're not they're not inspired by policy a lot of the time even though if we don't have that policy there we'll never get anywhere um so uh, next slide Marna. so the i think the underlying uh the underlying idea of of this initiative was to start with the basics and the practical the things we were trying to give people through the guide were you know just that just enough information and then practical examples and then some good links to to resources or websites that we thought were were really clear and, and gave people a lot um so you know trying to get people to understand that you know open educational practices can solve problems for people in their classrooms in their assessments that there are things uh, that you can do that will make your life easier will make the students life easier if everyone's life is easier that must be a that must be a good thing to do and if we can hook them at all then give them somewhere to go you know give them one more link you know in a in, a, in an area so that they can go and explore further um so just to build on what james is saying there um it was also from my experience of dipping my toe in the, in the open space and, and I really was interested in getting involved, but I did find um, some, of, some of the scholarship initially a bit off-putting. Um, so I, I, I in particular was trying to answer questions that I initially had. Um, so what, what we made was this beginner's guide, uh, go open a beginner's guide to edu open education. And also the librarians, again, very much their influence was uh, to make a libguide version that we can, which is a living place so that we can update, add resources. Um, so, for example, we launched the, uh, the resources there during the summer and we recorded the video and now that's on there, too. So it's a great way of, of keeping it a live space. Um, we're going to show we're going to show you both resources in a moment, but that just there's the link. But uh, maybe James, if you can put it in the chat, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> and this is the LibGuide version. So currently, the two versions are quite similar because um, obviously, uh, you know, a lot of time hasn't passed. But our aim is to to add to this. Um, and the LibGuides again, there's a quite a few different LibGuides out there. It's again, it's something that the librarians are really into. But there, it's a really nice. Um, web platform that libraries use um, and you can see very, quite user friendly and it was very easy to develop and also very easy to update so that you know it, we can we can we can uh, ensure that this lasts beyond the, the time of the project as well so so that is important too um, so we also make quite a lot of visuals um, partly because we thought they also are a way of hooking people in um, but we were also trying to give you know, give people reasons to go open and then ways to go open. So kind of in simple ways. So the big hook often, especially from the American literature we found is around around textbooks is save money for your students. Um, 
that possibly isn't as big a deal in, in other jurisdictions. Certainly in Ireland, students don't seem to spend as much on textbooks, but still, you know, the cost of going to university is still quite high. They have to pay fees. So if that helps, that's great. Uh, bring real world examples into your teaching. I think that particularly to me is quite attractive. Save time. Academics love saving time. Uh, and particularly during the pandemic period of, of, uh, of having to pivot online, it, you know, if you could find a good resource rather than creating one yourself, obviously that's a win-win. And, and very much the, the fourth thing there, this is actually very aligns very well with our university's mission, which is to transform lives and societies. So the idea of broadening access and, and we work our, ourselves in programs that have that aim. So to give access to groups that otherwise couldn't get access. And then in terms of the ways, again, we were looking for very simple messages, share your practice, you know, tweet something that you've created or put it in a repository. We give some examples of repositories, deposit your work in an open repository. Zenodo, we particularly like, um, but other, other repositories out there too. Use Creative Commons licensing. Um, and everything in this project is Creative Commons licensed too, including all the images and the videos and everything. Um, we tried to simplify that process because again, uh, we, we ourselves found uh, the process of choosing uh, uh, the right license a bit challenging, even though the Creative Commons actually is a brilliant license wizard, which, which is a great resource too. And then fourth, use open education resources. Do you have anything to add in there, James? That's a no, is it? James? Sorry, my, my phone is ringing. I'm only, I'm, I'm only recently back in my office and I don't know how to use this new handset they have in my office. <laughs> um, you know, uh, like this, this was the big thing for me was to try to put in as many hooks in terms of show people challenges, especially maybe low, low effort, low level challenges that could be addressed by low level, low effort, open educational practices. So if, if you can show people some of the major textbook open textbook repositories and they if in they if they look in there and could very easily find a textbook that was similar enough to a commercial textbook and if they replace that and saw you know an increase in student engagement with the readings because now that it's not difficult to source they're not looking on amazon they're not buying you know the wrong edition because it's cheaper they're not you know not getting it at all because they can't find it or they can't afford it you know if they, you know, if you can get people to just engage and tackle a little challenge uh, like that, then I think that's a good route into open educational practice for people. Yeah. And I think they were kind of simple messages as well, which is helpful. So in terms of the project, we, we've met the project deliverable in terms of the funding requirements, but we, we ourselves uh, have, have some additional next steps in the process. Uh, one thing we'd like to do is, is to, to conduct, a, conduct a bit of local research uh, a on on what part, uh, what what staff uh, think of the guides. Um, I know some students, so I know it's been integrated into a digital skills uh, for students module. So I'd be curious about how 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 the guides are being used, what people think of them, uh, and I suppose if it's having any impact in terms of people's engagement with open education. So that's the next phase. We have to design a study. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. I know we're not allowed to have Q and A now, but I'm going to just give a, a little guide, a uh, little look around the guide for a moment. And if if we're allowed to break the rules, we might take questions now. But I don't know if Jane Francis will agree to it. Uh, give me one sec just to get the website. Or James, do you have it handy? Oh, hang on. Yeah. I I have it now. And there's some nice questions in the chat. I don't know. I may I may answer them. Uh, so here's the LibGuide version. As I said, super e easy to design and build. Um, we got some learning designers involved later in the stage. And, and uh, uh, Alex, one of the designers, helped us uh, with the logos and stuff like that. Um, so you can see. Very, very simple questions and very simple answers, and that is on purpose. And in fact, that is actually hard writing in a kind of user friendly way. Um, and we did curate some stuff. Oh, I don't know what's going on there. Sorry. Yeah, hang on one sec. 
that link opened out. Um, you can see emphasis on the visuals. And then in terms of downloadable resources, everything is downloadable and there's the, the guide as well. Um, anything else I should point out here, James? No, I mean, it's just, you know, I suppose it was really good for us to have the dual output because the 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 form itself um, or the, the guide itself, we can only highlight that to the extent that we can normally highlight things. You know, we can just try and do that as much as possible. Whereas the lib guide is kind of like a permanent place in the university website that, you know, that will be there. And it's easy to find when pe if people go looking in the library for these kinds of resources, they, they will find that there. Um, yeah, it's in the it's on the university library website, and there was a good question there. How did you find effective incentives to engage academics? Yeah, we haven't actually. We're we're actually at, at a phase before that. Mice, to be perfectly honest, we're at the phase of this is what they are. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to we're trying to evangelize. Uh, we haven't a gotten bit. to the. Would you like to try and use one or make yeah. one? But I think I think the, the the next thing like that like we got just fifteen hundred euro of funding to do this work so that that was enough impetus for actually for us to form the group and actually get the work done if we hadn't got that 1500 euro 1500 euro is nothing but like it was enough to get us going so i think small scale teaching and learning funds this was so co you know this was kind of co-funded by the national forum and the university more schemes like that that encourage people to take their ideas around different teaching and learning practices like this. So it would be when those schemes come out, encouraging other people to go, hey, why don't you look at our guide? Maybe try, you know, try and do something around open textbooks, maybe make an open textbook with your students or something like that. And like if those, if people have those ideas and then there's some little bit of funding there to motivate them and actually pay for the graphic design or pay for, you know, a meeting or something, then I think we'll get more, we'll get more pockets of innovation and then hopefully mainstream these practices. And actually the deadline of having to spend the money, because that was actually what put, pushed us to finish, because you know how hard it is to finish sometimes. But actually, we had a deadline of this. This had to be done by this time. Uh, so if that actually was a great motivator to finish. Um, as James is saying, like on a national level in Ireland, uh, the, that national forum group there, they have really pushed open. Uh, and are developing open infrastructure, uh, national repositories just being formed, national policy. And, um, but funnily, it, I, I don't see the trickle down yet to the universities. Okay. So I think that's it. Um, unless, okay. unless we're allowed to take questions, Jane, are we? Uh, not yet. Uh, we have, okay, okay. Uh, I think we're doing great. The guideline it's uh, for every presenter to have the opportunity to make presentations within 20 minutes. Then we have a uh, 30 minutes for questions and discussions. So okay. I, I, I urge all the presenters to take note of the questions and the box I'm not able to follow through right now. So please just take note of your questions and we will, when we get back to the discussion, section we can trash all the questions thank you so much for thank you wonderful presentations and i'm also glad that your project was inspired by oe global two years ago i'm really glad about that so thank you so much thank you then the next one is uh, designing infrastructures allowing higher education teachers to reuse adapt and exchange oer by Nadine Schroeder, Sophia Kra, and Joannes Vent. Okay, so who is presenting? Yeah, Nadine is sharing the screen, oh, and both Nad of us Nad will be Nadina, presenting. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we'll, I'm not seeing anything yet. Oh, there it is. Okay, okay great. Okay. Um, yeah, we are really delighted to be here today and to present. Um, yeah, you our um, our research and uh, development on infrastructures for the use of OER. It's only going to be Nadine and me today, um, but I think that will be <laughs> that will be uh, good. Um, 
in our presentation, we will start with uh, some background information on our research project and our special focus will be on version management. Uh, after describing, shortly describing our interview study and some main results, we will then present some examples of our prototypical um, concept, including different phases of development and evaluation so that you will get an insight uh, into what we, will, uh, we, we have done um, with our research. Uh, yeah, now Nadine will start with the background information on our project. Um, yes, um, first of all, um, our, pro uh, our research is embedded in a project called Educational Architecture, um, which has the goal to make finding OER in German higher education landscape easier. Um, currently uh, in Germany, OER repositories are developed in several individual federal states as, as they act concerning education rather independently. And with the aim of reducing these federal organizational structures, the overall project uh, explores technical, didactical and organizational requirements for designing a distributed infrastructure for OER. Um, in our sub-project, we work on a research study with focus on expectations and needs of higher education teachers for OER. And, uh, for OER infrastructures with a special focus on version management functions and collaborative elements. Um, our goal was to identify and develop possible solutions for uh, designing OER platforms that can be adopted by developers. And um, yeah, we, are, we are aware that there are established solutions and platforms for OER in the international environment but our concern was to examine specific requirements from the German perspective. Um, um, as I mentioned before, one special focus was on version management. And the uh, first question is, what does version management have to do with OER? Uh, first of all, version control is mostly associated with software development and collaboratively working and editing software code. And this includes several functions, and uh, these functions concern two different aspects, versions and uh, derivatives. Um, and by changing, editing, updating one's own material, new versions were created. And especially when working together, version history and tracking changes are important. And uh, derivatives are created by using and adapting content of others. Um, these so-called for forks enable a connection between a derivative and the original version. And uh, both scenarios can be adopted for OER when we think of revising, reusing, remixing, and redistributing content according to the five Rs. And in the context of OER, uh, challenges that occur through different material types and file formats need to be considered. Uh, therefore, version management offers potential to be adopted for OER, but further research is needed regarding functions and design of a user-friendly interface for OER, which reaches needs and requirements of users. To get insight into those uh, specific research needs and our open questions, uh, we decided to contact, uh, conduct a semi-structured interview study with higher education teachers in German-speaking countries, um, focusing on the research questions, how do teachers create, use, and process OER? In which framework conditions does the work with OER take place? Um, what difficulties do teachers encounter when working with OER? What expectations do teachers have about working with OER? And most importantly, or at least that's what we are focusing on here, is uh, how can teachers benefit from version management functionalities? Um, we conducted uh, the interviews in uh, ju from July until September 2020. So yeah, during the pandemic as well. Um, we uh, talked with um, 23 
German speaking university lecturers from Germany and Austria. And we conducted a video interviews that lasted 30 to 60 minutes. Um, since the focus on the study was uh, or is on the practices of higher education teachers with OER, as well as their explicit and implicit knowledge about the use of OER, uh, we conducted the interviews with um, teachers with OER experience only. Um, but in order to adequately uh, represent the diversity of active OER users, um, some of the interview teachers just first encountered with, uh, with creating OER within the framework of projects mostly. Um, and other teachers have been continuously practicing OER within the teaching routine for several years. Um, in terms of subjects, six teachers came from the natural sciences and 11 participants from the humanities and uh, social sciences. As a introductory narrative stimulus, the teachers were asked to, pre uh, to present one of their own OER learn learning materials. So we therefore gained some um, knowledge about their real OER experience and expertise um, at, right at the beginning from the interviews. Now we'll be continuing with uh, some main results. Um, as we all know, OER can comprise um, material types with different scopes. Um, this ranges from illustrations to presentations and videos to entire courses. Um, OER that are published are often extensive material types with a high production effort, such as videos or courses. Thanks, Nadine. <laughs> this contrasts with the fact that teachers prefer external materials with a small scope that can be used independently, such as graphics, illustrations, or videos for use on, in their materials. Um, this also goes hand in hand with practice of integrating individual elements of external materials into their own materials and adapting them into some cases, in some cases. Um, in front of this background, in OER platforms, it should be possible to divide extensive materials into individual thematic units or formats. Um, lecturers consider the provision of new versions to be useful and sensible also in terms of quality assurance and for different scenarios. Reasons given for the availability of different versions include that changes over time can be shown and different editing scenarios can be provided. Likewise, uh, deleting or archiving older versions should be possible to maintain freedom of choice in, and the availability of older versions so that incorrect versions do not remain in circulation. Um, but when presenting different versions, an overview in form of a version history is desired by the lecturers um, and it all should also be possible to track changes between versions. Another um, really important uh, factor was, was uh, feedback and collabor collaboration. Um, the teachers seem to be very interested in, in, interested in learning about external use, editing, and further dissemination of the materials, for example, to obtain suggestions for possible applications. Um, and of course, teachers would like to receive feedback and suggestions on their own materials to improve and develop their content. The development of an OER community with opportunities to exchange materials can also help to create cross-site collaborations, as we all know. An active community can furthermore help to take over regular updating needs as uh, teachers' own resources are not always as sufficient, um, especially after projects have ended. For collab collaborative uh, editing of materials, teachers need a clear distribution of roles, which makes it possible for the responsible person to check and accept or reject changes made by the editors. Uh, collaborative authoring is also preferred in a closed space, though, so that a new version can be made openly available only after a certain stage of change has been reached. That was the main results, and uh, we're now going over to the prototypical concept, so something practical. Yes, uh, based on these results and um, analyzed version management functions, we developed a prototype concept for managing versions and derivatives of OER with collaborative elements. Um, we focused on requirements of users, relevant functions, uh, intuitive usability, especially comprehensible terms and arrangements, as well as usage in practice. 
Uh, what we didn't focus on are uh, design elements and technical implementation. Um, the development of the prototype comprised four versions, including a three-stage iterative evaluation process. Uh, based on the interview results, the first version was created and prepared for testing. And the first user test was conducted with e-learning staff during a focus group workshop with 12 participants. And this was followed by six individual ses sessions with higher education teachers who gave their feedback while running through different scenarios. And after these results have been included into the prototype, the interview participants were asked to take part in a survey in order to validate their requirements and opinions from the interviews. And currently we are finalizing the concept as a video, which is about to be published. Um, the evaluation process resulted in some additional or adapted functions, for example, regarding filtering different material types and change comments were divided into mandatory or pre-selection and optional free text. And the community space was developed and expanded as work in progress area. Um, we also ask for comprehensible terms and usability of processes. So as we know, derivative is not a common term. Uh, we figured out suitable terms for replacing it and uh, creating a derivative we described as add-on version and overview as further versions. Um, the, the concept involves views and functions regarding to add, archive and merge versions, uh, as well as a community and a working space. And in the following slides, I will present some examples. Here you can see a detailed view of a resource and its version history. Uh, the, the total resource, resource gets in DOI automatically, and for single versions, authors can optionally assign a DOI. Um, modifications are uh, described with the pre-selection and detailed change comments, comments can be um, specified. Here we have uh, an example of Tony testing as an author of this resource. And he can add a new version or archive older versions. In this view, uh, Tony has edited a resource from another author and he would like to provide an own version. And by clicking on add new add own version, a new uh, resource with Tony as author is created and a link to the original resource is integrated here to indicate this as derivative and to remain a connection between these resources. And in the record of the original resource, all derivatives can be viewed under further versions. So they are merged there. And at last, here is a brief look into the community space where work in progress materials can be shared and authors can ask for contributors. And uh, in our evaluation, we ask, asked how intuitive the functions are for users. And concerning this, we got quite good feedback, um, as well as the practical applicability seems to be on the right track. Uh, to conclude, um, we have to admit that our study has some limitations due to the number of interview participants. Uh, we are pretty sure that there are that there be more requirements and functions which should be considered but couldn't be identified throughout our current research. And in addition, the ev evaluation took place in a predefined scenario and not under real conditions. Um, as next step, we will publish a video presenting all functions as a start uh, only in German. And uh, a technical concept of the prototype with implementation in, a, in an OER repository is desired, but out of scope of this research project. 
So, and uh, finally, we're interested in your individual situations. Um, so which OER platforms do teachers use at your institutions and do these platforms integrate version management functions or collaborative elements? And yeah, we can, um, maybe we can discuss this uh, at the end. Thank you for your attention and we are finished. Oh, thank you, thank you so much, lovely. Uh, just 15 minutes, uh, we are right on time. Thank you so much for giving us five minutes extra so that we can add that to our question session. So thank you so much, lovely presentation, so much to learn from the work, ongoing work. Then the fourth presentation is a pathway to learning international collaboration under COVID-19 by Robert Faro et al. Okay, you're welcome. Right okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Rob Farrow. I'm a senior research fellow in the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University in the UK. And today uh, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, GCRF Pathways project. So um, the uh, Pathways project uh, actually took place last summer and um, was very much like some of the other projects discussed today, a kind of pandemic response. And uh, in this case, it was a collaboration between um, the Open University, uh, several departments within the Open University. So that includes uh, the Institute of Educational Technology, which is where I'm based, uh, the International Development Office, uh, the Faculty of Wellbeing, Education and Language Studies, and the School of Education, Childhood, Youth and Sport. Um, and as well as uh, several African institutions coordinated by the African Council for Distance Education. Uh, and these include Centre for Research in Distance and Online Learning in Nigeria, the National Open University of Nigeria, the Open University of Tanzania, and the University of South Africa. And the idea behind this collaboration was to provide uh, professional development and um, support for African educators uh, during the pandemic. And um, one thing that I think uh, is quite kind of interesting about this project was it was done on, a, on an agile basis. So everything happened pretty quickly. And um, if you're familiar at all with the way that uh, course production normally works at the Open University, uh, it takes many months to years to write courses and have them go through um, rounds of peer review and, and uh, improvement. So um, while it did draw on expertise uh, developed through that model, um, it was uh, different to the way that uh, courses are normally produced. Um, so two courses were developed during this time. And um, uh, in addition to the content itself, they were supported by various uh, online events, which I'll go on to describe. Um, so in total, there were uh, people involved from 16 countries and uh, more than 30 higher education institutions in Africa. Uh, so there's a big team on this project and a big list of co-authors, not proposing to go through all of them right now um, because there's quite a few, um, but everyone works in one of the places that I referred to on the previous slide. Um, and we've got, uh, roughly half and half balance between UK based and African based uh, people in the team. Um, and uh, in some ways, uh, it was new territory for everyone involved in this. Um, and when we got the funding to do this work, the concept behind it was, um, we've already got a certain amount of uh, open resources at the Open University. And we've got material around professional development and moving your teaching online and digitalization and so on. Um, and the question was, how can we um, make the most of that and tailor it to this specific context and this set of needs? 
So um, two courses were developed, one for uh, teacher educators and one for uh, tertiary education. So um, but the, the idea behind both of them was quite similar. Um, so it's to support people who don't necessarily have any experience of teaching online um, and give them the support that they need to feel more confident doing that. Uh, so um, all of this was happening last summer and um, in addition to the courses themselves being made available, there were around 12 webinars, um, each one around a specific area of expertise. Um, and this is partly why the project team is quite big because people were brought in to deliver um, these webinars based on their own areas of expertise. Uh, but there are also some other sort of supplementary activities and things that just sort of developed as the, the initiative went on. Um, I suppose I just want to offer uh, a moment to uh, for people to reflect on their own situation. You've probably been doing this anyway as we've been talking about these different initiatives. Um, but just thinking about the pandemic and you know the kind of unfolding picture there in terms of the impact on education. Um, generally speaking, there's been a move towards online education, um, even in areas that have traditionally been a bit resistant to that. Um, but most of this has happened in a kind of crisis management way where people have just had to pivot into um, actually sort of doing what, um, doing what you shouldn't do a lot of the time, which is just basically try to replicate your face-to-face -face teaching, but in an online environment. Um, so I think beyond um, these kind of uh, groups that we were working with um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, there's probably a lot of people out there who would benefit from a bit more guidance and a bit more support in how they've sort of taken their teaching online um, during the pandemic. And I think also there's a kind of, um, there's a, a question here around what an open response looks like to this because what, what's often happening is um, commercial organizations are moving into that online space and delivering um, sort of solutions, um, bundled proprietary resources to help people you know, with their teaching. Um, and that's understandable because uh, people need solutions to their, you know, the, the crisis that we're going through and, and no one's finding it particularly easy necessarily to do this online teaching. Um, but I think it is also an opportunity for uh, developing an open uh, response and building the right sort of networks, sharing in the right sort of ways. And um, I think this is part of what we should be thinking about when we talk about building capacity. It's not even just in your institution or in the institutions that you're working with, but in, in a more general sense um, and in, you know, in, in respect of the commons. So, um, the idea behind what we were doing, the logic, if you like, there are quite a lot of different sorts of demands on educators who are involved in this online pivot. And um, obviously in Africa, not everyone has reliable access to the internet. So this is an, another complicating factor. Um, the Open University has quite a lot of open resources and a lot of expertise in teaching online and distance education. And um, we also have uh, some quite innovative approaches to how to teach online and how to um, develop pedagogies for online education. And we, uh, we have a, an international development office which, which uh, historically has worked on um, these kind of uh, projects as well, which most universities don't have. So the, the idea behind all this was, how can we make the most of these uh, affordances and these uh, OERs that we've already got? And how can we uh, work with these educators in Africa um, and develop their capacity for online learning? So the first uh, source of content for the Pathways courses is this badged open course, which is on OpenLearn called Take Your Teaching Online. 
and this course is aimed at people who are coming from a face-to-face -face teaching background and uh, are interested in moving to online provision and obviously this is this dates from before the pandemic um, but it has you know a lot of the same content that's relevant to people making that switch um, some, you know stuff around accessibility stuff around the advantages or challenges of teaching online and delivering content in that way and that's that's free for anyone to access and, and take Uh, the second source uh, is the Tessa MOOC, uh, the, also available on OpenLearn. Uh, Tessa stands for Teacher Education in Sub-Saharan Africa. And again, this predates the pandemic, um, about 16 hours of learning. And uh, again, focused on how to move in the direction of um, teaching online and using OER and improving accessibility and these kind of things. Um, but in this case, tailored towards uh, African educators, as specifically as teacher educators, this course was developed for. So, um, so the idea was to um, draw on that content, but uh, go beyond it in a way to have a more sort of supported uh, approach. So this included um, a series of different sort of webinars and presentations, as well as asynchronous activities and communications. Uh, and as I'll um, explain shortly, there were also some other things that just emerged out of what people were doing and people found their own ways to communicate around the content. So um, on this kind of rapid basis, these two courses were produced. Each was about six weeks or so of e-learning. And um, this uh, comprised of uh, open materials and open course and a series of webinar events for each program. And there were also um, different community activities. So in addition to the sort of uh, webinars that were there to support the content, there were sort of guest speakers uh, coming in to talk about different topics. Uh, we also used the Enquire and Our Journey platforms. So the Enquire platform is like a citizen science inquiry led approach. And um, the Our Journey approach is uh, based around uh, encouraging people to sort of record their emotional states and responses at different points to encourage a kind of reflection on how your learning journey is progressing and how it's developing. Um, there's, there was a forum and um, a telegram group um, emerged and it was uh, really coming out of what people on the, who were taking the course wanted to use. Uh, that was the, the platform that people were most interested in using. Um, I don't know enough to say that that's what um, people in that area generally use. I'm not sure about that. Um, but that was the thing that people said, we want to communicate on this platform. Uh, so we did uh, an evaluation, which I'll present the results of shortly, and that included uh, pre and post surveys, as well as interviews and metrics directly from the platform. And when we were going into um, sort of early phase of this, uh, the challenges that we were kind of um, aware of were, first of all, it's not a one size fits all thing, but we're going to have to make it that, right? So there's quite diverse audiences that we were um, developing this um, content for, um, but we have to sort of just uh, on a rapid basis produce it and um, hope that it um, hits the right notes, um, but also have a little bit of um, responsiveness to how people were receiving it so that we could make adjustments if needed. Um, we also didn't know who the audience was gonna be necessarily because it was happening so quickly that, um, uh, there wasn't time to research who's the market for this and who's, you know, who are our learners and let's model what kind of experiences they're going to have. Um, in addition, because everyone is essentially uh, stuck at home, just doing stuff on Zoom and through the, the uh, VLE and that kind of thing, um, how do we create a sense of community? How do we make sure that people feel like they're part of some bigger cohort? And um, this was done primarily through the webinars and through the asynchronous um, activities. 
So uh, what does it look like to be on these courses? Well, it might look a bit familiar, um, the old Zoom webinar. Um, in some ways, uh, you know, the Zoom, the Zoom, the Zoom uh, conference call is one of the distinctive experiences of the pandemic for a lot of people. And it's a, arguably a surprisingly common experience around the world because it's become the kind of dominant way of doing things. Um, so um, in this case, uh, much as we're doing today, combinations of slide-based presentations plus uh, uh, webinars and um, an interesting sense of telepresence perhaps um, with the sort of conference calling and being able to see people's faces which um, isn't all you know isn't doesn't always happen that way and again maybe contributes towards a bit more of a sense of community uh, so most of the time there would be um, uh, content um, supported by activities and um, these guest speakers um, quite a lot of um, different stuff that was covered and quite a lot of um, um, moving in different directions and bringing in these different experiences because with so many different authors and, and different experts uh, delivering content on the course, uh, it was in some ways maybe asking quite a lot of people to you know, take in so much in one go uh, with all these different platforms, different um, uh, pedagogical approaches and different technologies. So overall, um, there were about um, nearly 1400 registrations across the two courses. This only applies to the initial presentation. So this is just who signed up at first for the initial presentation. Um, and we had uh, about 16 countries, said uh, more than 30 HEIs. Just under half of the people in the first wave were coming from Nigeria and um, between a quarter and a third from Kenya. Um, those, those two numbers, the disparity represents the two different courses that were presented. So um, who was taking the course? What was their starting point? Um, so just over three quarters already had some experience of teaching online. Um, but not necessarily um, as a teacher. So most of them were coming from the point of view of having done some online learning. Um, just over 10% had already taken uh, another free OU course. Um, and what was uh, the consistent uh, picture, if you like, was that people were saying that they're already experiencing a big change in how they're doing their job because of the way that they're moving towards online learning in the pandemic. And you can see from the information in the table here. Uh, so, um, whereas about a third were, all, were doing purely face-to-face -face and roughly a third were doing mostly face-to-face -face before the pandemic, those numbers came right down to sort of six, seven, eight percent. Um, whereas uh, during the pandemic, 42 percent of people were um, teaching purely at a distance, another 12 and a half percent, mostly at a distance. Before that was only a quarter of the entire uh, cohort. So you can see that people were already, if you like, in the midst of that pivot and in the midst of that move to online learning when they started taking the uh, Pathways courses. One thing that's kind of interesting is, um, I said seven, uh, 700 people um, on one course and 600 on the other, roughly. Um, what happened is this content remains online. Uh, it's unsupported in the sense that there isn't the regular webinars, but you can go and view the, the, the um, stuff that was recorded. Um, so the initial presentation, um, by the time we got to sort of August, July, August uh, last year, they'd already finished, right? They'd done the, the six weeks of their course or whatever, but um, I only have data going up to January this year, but you can see a massive uh, spike, ongoing registrations um, and people continuing to uh, be awarded badges by completing the course. And I think this is quite an interesting thing where this isn't even supported, if you like, in the same way that the original presentation was. This is just content now. 
but there's still a lot of people going and taking those courses and working through them. You could say it's a response to you know, the, the ongoing need for support in the pandemic, um, but it's just goes to show you that once you make these things open, people do continue to take them. Uh, so this um, chart shows you the pattern of activity over the um, initial uh, presentation. So the dark blue line is, if you like, people going through and ticking the box each week, in each activity to say, yes, I've done this. And you can see that it went from about 500 to um, just around just under 300 by the end. Those are the people who have basically been through everything and ticked the boxes to say, yes, I've read this, I've done this activity and so on. Um, this is for the tertiary education course. But if you look at the uh, orange line and the kind of turquoise teal line, uh, those represent the Zoom activities. So those were always more popular than people working through the course content. And um, uh, it goes to show that there are some people who are basically just dropping in for those parts of it and they didn't necessarily want to take the course, but they wanted the support of the community and to um, hear what was being said um, in the uh, presentation sessions. Uh, you can also see the yellow line is people who were going back and viewing stuff afterwards. So um, after things have been recorded and made available, people are also going back and watching them later. Uh, this is the same graph for the other course. So this is the teacher educator and um, very similar pattern. Um, you have uh, the dark blue line showing um, people working through the course, a little bit of attrition, as you'd expect, um, and then the Zoom presentations in orange and turquoise. So a pretty, pretty good pattern of engagement overall. Um, alongside the, uh, the synchronous sessions, we had um, a forum for the teacher education course uh, not for the tertiary education course because it's uh, a different on a different platform. Um, I mentioned Telegram before. Uh, tele, you know, there's probably people here who know more about this than me, but it seemed that uh, Telegram was popular um, in the Africa countries that were involved in the uh, in the courses, and um, that just basically had a life of its own, right? So it wasn't moderated in any way by um, anyone who was involved in presenting the, the courses. Um, but nearly a thousand messages. My observation is they were sort of good quality messages, like detailed discussion and people being quite open and honest. And I think this was a very useful and sort of confidence building aspect of what was going on. We didn't plan for that, right? That was just something that emerged from the activities. Uh, in the evaluation, people were asked, um, whether they were satisfied with um, what they were offered in these courses. Uh, you can see here that um, in excess of 90% uh, either agreed or strongly agreed that they were satisfied. Uh, obviously it's important to know that's a self-selecting response. Uh, similar picture when people were asked about the impact on their practice. So uh, you can see here, um, more than 90% said yes a lot or yes somewhat to whether the uh, material that they'd been engaging with and the activities were gonna influence their practice. And um, people said, yes, they, they believe that it would. Um, we collected quite a lot of qualitative data. Um, so what comes out of that in terms of the themes uh, that people mentioned when they were talking about you know what the impact would be on their own institution uh, you've got things like a change in how teaching is organized or how learning is designed um, there was also quite a lot of interest in assessment and how assessment would work online and you can see on the right hand side um, it was the most common thing that people said they were interested in moving forward was um, to understand how assessment would work in a, in a distance learning scenario. Um, other things that people mentioned, uh, I guess feeling slightly galvanized to explore new kinds of approaches, new activities, new ways to upskill. Uh, 
having more um, support for personal development and engaging in external training. There's also a lot of interest in um, openness and becoming a kind of champion for open approaches in their own institution or for digitalization. Um, and more generally, I think, feeling empowered to enact change or to, um, to start the process of um, criticizing and looking for ways to improve uh, the way that things are done. And these were all key goals for the courses. So um, just to summarize, uh, this project was definitely a success. And um, I think people on all sides of it uh, did some important learning about how things might work um, in a, in a post-pandemic situation. Uh, the, there is an, a report available on the uh, Open University's re uh, repository. I'll put a link onto the um, uh, schedule for um, anyone who wants to see it. Um, in some ways, the main outcome was this sense of improved confidence, um, partly confidence in dealing with online learning, but also confidence uh, for educators in themselves to be agents of change and to um, be in control of the process of designing learning and um, trying out different approaches and being innovative as a kind of culture. Um, one thing that's important to note is that the amount of flexibility mattered, right? So partly it's about people's access to uh, the internet, partly it's about other pressures on people's time and time differences and that kind of thing. So um, the more flexible that we could be, the more that was appreciated, although that does have implications for your balance between synchronous and asynchronous. Um, I said there was some attrition, but overall, um, about two thirds of the people who signed up originally completed the programs. But they also, also, once we finished the initial presentation, there were quite a lot of people who um, continued to access those materials. Um, maybe the people got bombarded with a bit too much, right? Because um, when the courses were being put together, it was a very sort of inclusive, like you could probably have filled a, you know, uh, an MA or something with the amount of content people were being introduced to if you were to do it in a bit more detail. Um, so some, sometimes people say they just didn't have the, the bandwidth to engage with everything, such as these uh, new platforms that I mentioned. Um, so I mentioned before that assessment and OER were um, of particular interest to people. Um, another area that was uh, valued was learning design and um, I guess specifically learning design for online learning rather than um, uh, for face-to-face -face, uh, because that's an area where it's actually quite difficult to um, get that support, I think. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, um, the, one of the key things is this shift in confidence and um, greater willingness to experiment um, as the people are moving forward with online and blended approaches. Uh, just, to, just to finish up, um, kind of update on what's happening with this work now. I mentioned before that the um, uh, assessment and online assessment was of particular interest and this was highlighted in the evaluation. So some money's been made available internally and the sort of evolution of this work is that there is now a new pathways aspect, which is this, um, e-assessment for African higher education. And um, uh, the links there uh, on the slide, there's already my slides are linked on the um, schedule if you wanna go and read more about it. But this is basically an ongoing work. There's ongoing um, events and um, outputs relating to this. So it's become a kind of um, ongoing strand of work, whereas originally it was just a kind of very time bound um, short project. It's proven to have a life beyond that. So quite interesting um, that you can do this kind of agile rapid response stuff 
um, and it can continue and kind of uh, get a life of its own. So overall, the project's been um, pretty successful, I would say. Um, I just have to offer the slight caveat that um, I'm just a, a small part of this project, right? I don't know everything about what's been going on in it. Um, and um, the person who's now leading this work is uh, Professor Denise Whitelock, who's the director of the Institute of Educational Technology. Um, but I will do my best to answer any questions about it that you might have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. And I thank everybody for your patience and for listening attentively. Yes, my work now is to draw on the presentations and the comments, but before that, I'm required to provide a summary of the presentations, which I'm going to do in less than three minutes or so. So the first presentation was uh, on framework for categorizing digital learning materials by Ben Jansen and uh, Robert Shaw. Interestingly, the presentation focused not only on digital education resources, not only on OER, but generally on digital education resources, including open educational resources. And this framework was uh, adapted by David Weil uh, framework, David Weile, his framework, and the, the presenters um, categorized this framework using two dimensions, access and uh, adaptation right and presenting an in frame, uh, interesting framework. It highlights uh, adaptation right from the no to the most adaptable position. And uh, also using this framework, it gives the users the opportunity to cut, uh, categorize the following types of digital learning resource or understand the following types of digital learning resource. I'm sorry, there's a fly really on my head. Yes, and open education resources, these are presented it in four categories, open education resources, open educational resources, semi-open resources, commercial resources, and the closed resources. And the presentation uh, concluded with interesting findings and remarks. So that's that for the first one. Then the second presentation is on go open supporting higher education staff engagement in open education practices. And uh, it's in heartwarming to note that this project was inspired two years ago by the Open Education Global Conference. And there they uh, observed collaborative experiences and projects presented in the conference between the librarians and other faculty staff. And they're looking inward, they got back to their institution and also observed pockets of similar project, but they took the time to see if they could work towards that and elaborate that the more. And the question posed were, how do we try to hook the interest of people, not previously uh, practitioners uh, in open education, how do we try to gain their interest in this uh, project? And in further clarification of concept, they try to clarify some content that could be a bit intimidating to uh, new entrants to open education, so concepts like open pedagogy, open education policy, and so on. And they also noted that the underlining idea is to start from the basics, provide uh, practical examples and good links, and also to get people to understand and uh, embrace the beauty of open education. And the reasons to go open, they provided the following reasons, some of the following reasons. It saves money, it brings real world examples, and it saves also the, uh, the time reusing existing materials and contributes to broadening access to education. And four ways to go open suggested by the presentations where, where, where participants were required to share their open practice, deposit their, their, their work in open repositories, use the CC licensing, the Creative Commons licensing, and use open educational resources. And the presentation concluded 
with interesting um, recommendations, further recommendations. The third presentation is on designing infrastructure, allowing higher education teachers to reuse, adapt, and exchange open educational resources. Uh, it is a research project uh, basically on educational ad ar architecture, as I understand, basically looking at finding OERs and te technical infrastructure for open educational resources. And the research study uh, focused on expectations and need of open educational resources, as well as collaboration. And uh, utilizing the version management uh, and OER, they presented different concepts arising from the, uh, the platform. They uh, showed us the, the, those concepts that could give us further insight on the, the platform and their vision too. And research questions looked at areas on OER activities, requirements and needs, version management functionalities, and so on. And they also the participants withdrew from 23 German speaking uh, participants, teachers, six from national, uh, natural science, 11 from humanities and the social sciences. And the study was conducted between July to September, 2020, in the peak of the pandemic. And the results also provided some insightful findings, looking at the feedback, the co uh, community collaborative uh, and, uh, and so on. Then the last one is um, the pathway project by Rob and Eta. It's a collaboration between the OU UK and the ACDE, African Council for Distance Education Institutions, as, uh, affiliated to the African Council for Distance Education. And the, 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 the objective is to provide professional development and support for African open education during the pandemic. And uh, we also observed that two courses were designed during this project, uh, process, and it involved uh, 16 countries and more than 30 higher education institutions in Nigeria. And the courses ran for over six weeks from July to August, 2020. And uh, some reflections and questions were, what does an open response look like? What do, what is the long-term impact? What do the long-term impact mean for educators and professional development? And what are the longer-term impact of pandemic to education? Those are some of the questions. And another one is uh, that, that some of the questions noted. And the, the overall insight was that the pandemic provides us with opportunity to build on open responses to education. And uh, specifically mentioning the course, the one is taking your teaching online, the free course. And the second one is a, a TESA course that uh, tailored towards a uh, teacher education, specifically for African uh, to teachers in Africa. And they also identified key challenges. They noted that coordination across institutions and countries were quite challenging. And they, they had difficulty predicting the number of registrations and activities. And also wondered if uh, participants would really understand what the course is all about. But the cheering news is that um, the pre and the post survey we are quite significant positively. So the observations made in the pre-survey where there were more significant views to, uh, towards the post-survey. And this indicates uh, the gain in this area. And this was also confirmed by the presenter of the evidence of the huge success of this uh, course. So that is my summary. Um, I want to invite my co-host uh, to, I don't know if she was able to help identify the questions and uh, we're going to take it one after the other. We're going to, are there, are there questions linked to the first presentation? The one, uh, the first presentation on a framework for categorizing digital learning materials. Are there questions specifically for them? I'm supposed to have my co-facilitator here. 
Um, I don't, is that uh, I'm the rapporteur? <laughs> yes. I might I might be <laughs> that as well. Um, well, there was one question. I don't know if it's still wanted from Derek, um, who asked, "Can digital resources be offline, and would that affect the our uh, accessibility access criteria?" I don't know if you want to say more about that, Derek. Or I. I, thanks very much. I, I thought um, B's response to it, uh, linking to a, a post about Schrodinger's cat, was a was a, a fairly articulate response. Uh, um, so I, I feel like it's been on, answered with uh, with a, with, a, with a, another question, and that's fine. Okay. I think James. Oh, okay. Okay. No. Any other questions for the first presentation? Okay, so the second one, go open, supporting higher education staff engagement in open educational practices. Any questions for them? We love talking. Everyone we do here. love talking. Most and most actually, we have another, we, another, another of the team came along, Eamon, yeah. just, to, just to rope you in, Eamon. So yes, we have three, on, on three on that, on that, Were you able to collect your questions because you were really? I think I answered one, but uh, if there's if there's more, we'd be happy to. Yeah. To... yeah there, there was the one question about incentivization, and like really, we're and we were discussing it in the chat. We're really still pushing at the intrinsic, like trying to just show people, you know, if they've ever been bothered by the students not reading the stuff, or they've ever been they've heard about this idea. Yeah, why are we just like making students do assessments and then dumping them at the end of the year and never doing anything with them and going, wow, wouldn't it be cool if we did like get the students to do something that went out in the real world or they were engaged with the real world a bit more? If you get them, if they have half a thought like that and you can grab them, you know, we're trying to increase that intrinsic motivation to solve a problem they're seeing or solve a frustration they're having, but like little bits of funding never does any harm either, like Orna was saying. And half of it is if someone gives you even a small amount of funding, the, 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 the drive to not lose it by not doing the project on time is, is a pretty good you know, psychological driver. Um, so that, that bit of support. And then obviously we were talking about in the, in the chat, the big thing is academic culture and productivity metrics and promotion metrics and, and frameworks need to, re, you know, respect and, uh, What's the word? Rewards. Give, give credit for, you know, mm -hmm. engaging in teaching and learning practice, especially things like uh, open educational practices, open science, all that, you know, all that kind of stuff. If that's recognized more, people will do it more because when you're completely strapped for time and you're doing 20 things at the same time, you know, you will use the frameworks you've been given, you know, in terms of this framework says if you're doing your job or not. If that says, engage in teaching and learning innovation, engage in open education practices, people will do them more. Yeah, and it's also the problem sometimes in some institutions like our own, uh, that uh, developing open educational resources isn't necessarily counted as publication. Um, so there are some, some factors like that I'm sure everyone can relate to. Okay, thank you so much. We have further clarifications here. Yeah? Okay, so let's go to the third presentation, uh, designing infrastructure, allowing higher education teachers to reuse, adapt and exchange open educational resources. Do we have specific questions for this group? Uh, sorry, I, I couldn't track the question. I was busy. Uh, yes, Mo um, I think mostly it was discussions going on in the chat rather than um, questions. So it's probably best if we just ask if anybody still has a question um to uh, to shout out now yes i have one question uh, uh because i i i i i love the uh, thinking about version oer because i think that that, that that's a that's a big problem uh, which uh, uh which you uh, have, 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 have do lovely things in solving that one thing i was uh, um uh, asking myself how do you keep track of versions that arise outside of the repository Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, we um, we didn't include this issue in 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 this concept. Yeah, but we we have to think about it. That's right. Yeah. 
Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Do we have more questions for group three? Okay. Then the last presentation, uh, the pathway project. Do we have specific questions for this group? The pathway project. I observed uh, just, quite just, a I lot one, of- One for Rob, yeah. yeah. Just curious about the assessment one, Rob. So is that kind of a spin-off? You're on mute. Uh, thank you. Um, basically, yes. Uh, it's a spin-off. It wasn't part of the original um, concept. The original concept was really quite limited, right? It was very rapid turnaround. I think the whole thing was two months, the, whole, the entire project. Um, and six weeks of that was, was delivery. So um, it all happened very quickly. Um, I'm not involved with the ongoing work around assessment, um, but my impression is so many people said this is the area that we need help with um, that we've tried to sort of respond and meet that need um, and um, the specifics of it I'm not entirely sure right but I imagine the general drive of it would be moving away from kind of automated quiz based stuff and into more kind of complex assignments and so the question is how do you facilitate that. This is a general issue for online learning, I would say. Um, so I imagine that's the direction it's going in. It's going to sort of authentic assessments, um, maybe reusable stuff. I don't know. Um, it's possible. Is but it I think, a slide or anything, Rob? Because I'd be curious and linking up with whoever is involved in that bit. Yeah, I'll just put the link in the chat. Hang on. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Uh, Derek, I think your hand is up. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Rob. I, I enjoyed the, the presentation and I also attended your presentations yesterday and, and you mentioned the SAMR framework. And to me, it, it, it seems as if there are, are, are two, two issues that kind of define your audience. Maybe one being uh, um, they're perhaps at the substitution phase where they're really just looking for an alternate to being in person and on campus and really are, are, are looking just to substitute face to face with on lot with with straight zoom um, on, um, synchronous teaching and maybe that defines your audience and then the other thing that defines the audience is perhaps those who can afford to actually pay the the costs of data um, um, because if you're working from home, then you don't have institutional uh, um, uh, sponsorship for for um, accessing uh, the, the internet, um, and and it is really expensive to to for for the average phone user to to pay for data here in Africa. Um, I I also think it, it is interesting to see that shift into assessment because to me that points to maybe some movement from SAMO where they're actually starting to ask how can we augment our teaching using on online type of stuff? And that's a really interesting avenue, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks for that. I think um, I, am, I, am sort of, uh, I am sort of focused on the SAMO framework at the moment um, and how we can kind of use it to describe different OER adoption situations. Um, and I think in some ways, pandemic response for most people was just like, okay, first of all, how do I survive in this new environment? How do I manage to carry on doing what I'm doing? But then um, as you get people used to this uh, alternative way of doing things, they start to see new possibilities and they start to think, okay, so could I do it this way? Could I do it that way? I think the focus on learning design is part of that progression. So people go from, okay, I'm just in the midst of it, I'm doing the teaching, you know, I'm doing it in this slightly uncomfortable new way. But um, through learning design, people start to be sort of take a step back and conceptualize what they're doing in a slightly more abstract way, slightly more meta way. Um, and that can be a route to new affordances and new ways of looking at things. Um, so yeah, I find that useful. And I think um, with the access side, I'm not an, I'm not an expert on uh, people's internet access in sub-Saharan Africa. One thing I remember that was happening was um, 
people would only be online at certain times of day, right? Because the, the system just wasn't online like 24 hours a day. It was like, if you have a, a, a webinar, you need to try and hold it at a time when people's uh, internet's turned on and that yeah. kind of thing. Um, yeah. So uh, so one uh, sort of byproduct from that was the need to factor in more asynchronous uh, opportunities so that we weren't dependent on people having access at a particular time to be able to participate. Um, and so the more flexible you could make it, uh, the more chance there was for people to be able to engage and participate. So that was definitely one of the sort of learning outcomes for us is like the more flexible you make it, the better. Um, so yeah, um, that has implications for your formats, your technologies that you're using, the timing of things, um, uh, how you uh, organize the assessments and activities and that sort of thing. So. So yeah, more flexible, the better for this audience, it seems. Thank you. Yeah, it's probably true you, for most uh, audiences though. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I think I can relate to your comments on the accessibility, the data issue in Africa. And I also appreciate the fact that the course is as flexible as possible and more asynchronous because data here is quite, uh, it's a different story and it's not predictable, okay? I'm really surprised that I'm still holding on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> One other okay. comment just quickly on this um, is awareness that a lot of people are using their mobile device to access the internet as well. Yeah. So we had to sort of design for that. And the fact that people might not be at a desktop machine at home or whatever, they might just be on a mobile and that's their main way of accessing the internet. So that had some implications for how we approached it as well. Yeah, likewise yeah, for right. our students, uh, the main way for accessing internet is through their mobile phone. So I'm glad you took note of that. So Derek, you wanted to say something? Uh, the, the challenge would be, how do you teach um, learning design through mobile phones? <laughs> um, well, as far as I'm aware, the uh, Open Learn platform has been designed to be accessible by phone. Um, a lot of the Open University's resources are designed for accessibility and they go through various rounds yes. of auditing and peer review to make sure they are as accessible as possible. So, um, so yeah, I guess you can do it. Um, I wasn't personally involved in that side of it, but assuming that it meets the standards we have for other stuff, then should be okay. But. But I think it has implications for how you design tasks and you know how yes. much text you're expecting yes. people to read in one go and that sort of stuff. Okay. All right. So I think uh, we have uh, we're supposed to end uh, in 20, 23 minutes. So, but we can we can actually close early, right? So I want to thank everyone for your time, your presentations, for active partic uh, participation. And uh, we are also going to share the link of the OEG Connect uh, where, uh, chat window so that the participants can continue the discussions there. So um, uh, Secretariat, any other thing for us? Are we good to close the session? Yes, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, it's been an amazing session, uh, very interesting with everything that's been put on. On the actual page, I've put um, all the links that we've been, that you have been sharing with us and the chat will also be shared. But thank you everyone for being here. It's been really great. And um, Jane, do you want to close? Yeah, yeah, nothing much. So just to thank everyone again for, very active presentations and participations. Uh, I'm sure we learned so much from this uh, interesting session. Okay, so take care, stay safe, and uh, greetings from Nigeria. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>